Thank you for joining me again today as I talk about this, our study that we're doing, Lies Women Believe and the Truth That Sets Them Free. This week we have been talking about the lies that women believe about sin. Satan would really like us to refuse to access all of the gifts that are ours in Christ. That there are so many things that are promised to us that will help us to have victory here on earth and to expand Christ's kingdom. And Satan would like us to, yeah, just not, not take them. Okay, to, to keep, your, keep, us, keep ourselves away from them. And so, since he is the father of lies, he employs lies to keep us from those gifts that we have so that we don't access them. If he can get us to have a wrong idea about sin, he can keep us from engaging in the breastplate of righteousness that Christ gives us in order to protect our hearts from him and to be able to move forward with confidence and safety into the territory that Satan has claimed. And so he would like us to believe untrue things about our sin so that we cannot exhibit righteousness. So let's take a look at some of the lies that he convinces us about our sin. The first lie that our author brought up is the lie that I can sin and get away with it. Satan tries us tries to get us to believe that the only real difference between living a righteous life and a sinful life is that a righteous life takes a lot more work and you have to say no to a lot of fun things. That the only reason to really choose righteousness is to just kind of indulge this powerful God here, you know, he might be unreasonable, but he makes the rules, so let's go ahead and indulge him. He'd like us to believe that there's no real benefits from a close relationship with God. And the truth is that walking with Christ is walking in freedom, much more than anything else that the world can offer that we have real freedom, we have real joy, we have real communion when we are walking tightly with God. And our sin inhibits that. That that is one of the devastating consequences of our sin. Our author has listed a lot more of them on page 96. The sin's consequences just to keep those in our minds when we think about indulging in a sin. That sin steals joy. That it removes our confidence. Sin bring, brings guilt. Sin gives Satan the upper hand. Sin quenches God's spirit. Sin brings physical damage. Sin causes an ache in the soul. Sin breaks God's heart. Sin opens the door to other sins. Sin breaks fellowship with God. Sin produces fear. And sin makes me its slave. If we want all of those promises that are yes to us in Christ, we need to keep in, as close to God as we can to keep in close communion with him. And our sin has the consequence of breaking that with, with him. And Satan knows that if he can keep the church from accessing all that they have in Christ, he will experience a whole lot op less opposition as he's going about his business on this earth. The second lie that women believe about their sin is that my sin isn't really that bad. We live in a really comparative culture where we think, you know, that person and the way they do things, that's bad. 
the way I do things, eh, that's just, that's okay, really. It's, it's not that bad. Like, seriously, have you seen them? And we, we get this in um, uh, our relationships with other humans that often we are choosing whatever is the best option or the least bad option. And so we believe this lie that as long as my sin isn't as bad as that one's, kind of like um, if a bear is chasing you, you don't have to be faster than the bear. You just have to be faster than the slowest person. And this sort of comparative righteousness really gets us slipped up. Comparative righteousness was absolutely the righteousness of the Pharisees, of Jesus' day, that they very much looked at themselves and looked at other people and they thought, whoa, I'm better than them. And you know what? Why I'm better than them? Because I try so much harder than them. And they worked really, really hard to have righteousness. And Jesus knew that and addressed that. And he said in Matthew 5, verse 20, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of God. Comparative righteousness isn't going to do us any good. Those guys, they were doing the best humanly possible. And it wasn't enough. Because our righteousness just isn't enough. Comparing ourselves to others is a false standard. That we have to compare ourselves against God's holiness. That when we do that, that's when we really get a real idea about the problem of our sin. The badness of our sin doesn't have to do with the badness of other people but instead about the pure holiness and purity of God. I loved the Puritan prayer that she included on page 100 of our book. Let me not forget that the heinousness of sin lies not so much in the nature of the sin committed as in the greatness of the person sinned against. We need to really recognize the heinousness of our sin so that we can get forgiveness from it and that we can keep it from separating us from God and all the promises that are ours in Him. The third lie that she talks about in our book is the lie that my sin, God can't forgive what I've done. Now, if we understand the badness of our sin, so we, we have a, a good perspective that way, Satan would like to push us off the other end and say that my sin is too giant for God to be able to forgive. Now, why that is so important is that if we can keep our sin in front of us and ever the most important thing that we focus on, we really can't see Christ and what he has done for us. So Satan would like to keep our sin ever before us and us being unable to focus on anything else because then we cannot access Christ and the forgiveness that he offers and all of the blessings that he offers. Now, it is an easy lie for us to believe because we very much see how some sins are unforgivable to humans. That there are people who don't forgive us. And so it's easy for us to fall into this trap to think that this sin, this big thing, this repetitive thing is too great for God to actually forgive. Now when we're doing that, we are reducing God from who he is, wholly other than us, to something like me but with superpowers and this is a real danger because God is not like us that he does not treat us as our sins deserve but his promise 
is that he has removed our transgressions from us as far as the east is from the west. These are his real promises to us. If we keep our sin always in the forefront and blocking, blocking our view of Christ, then we won't have access to that, that removal of our sin. We won't be living like we were forgiven from that sin. And Satan would like us to live as if we're unforgiven, as if we are still bearing the weight of our sin. Because that weight is too heavy for us to be able to go into battle with. We, when we are weighted down by the guilt of our sin, we can't oppose Satan. We can't do the work of Christ because we are carrying too much. So he would like us to believe that God hasn't taken that and that we still are, are responsible for it and have to work our way out of that because it gets, distracts us from the job that we're really intended to do. Colossians 2, 13 through 14. This is very clearly. He forgave all of our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away nailing it to the cross. Our sins, the big ones, the little ones, the world-breaking ones, are forgiven because of the cross. The fourth lie that women believe about sin is that it's not my fault. Now, first off, I want to make sure that everyone understands that somebody else's sin is not your fault. Now, this is a lie that is very much tied up in that my sin is not my fault. Because if my sin is not my fault, but really the circumstance or somebody else's fault, then somebody else's sin might be my fault. Because I might have created the, the situation where they would sin. Now, we need to very much believe the lot believe the truth that we are responsible not for the situation that was set in front of us but we are responsible for our responses in the situation for instance i have an anxiety disorder this was this is a situation that i'm in it is a reality that god has placed me in and that's not my fault. And how I respond is. Now, my kids have a regular responsibility to clean up their messes on Saturday morning. We don't make a big effort to clean up right before everyone goes to bed because we basically say, let's live in the house and then get the house back to livable all together on Saturday. And so we call it Saturday morning cleanup. Everybody knows it. Everybody dreads it, everybody hates it, and this is what we do. Except, the children don't just do it. They know that this is their responsibility, but they whine about it, they complain about it, they fight with each other instead of doing it. They are genu genu generally pretty bad during Saturday morning cleanup. And that is a real trigger for my anxiety that when they exhibit this bad behavior, my neurotransmitters start going berserk in me. That I feel unsafe, I feel out of control, all this adrenaline rushes up in me to try to fix the situation, to change it, to make it different, to protect me from this pain. And what seems like the best, most natural thing to do is for me to get really, really angry at them and to engage them with anger. Now, my anxiety disorder is not a sin. My anger is a sin. 
Satan very often tries to convince me that if I call my anger a sin, that that will be basically saying that I'm responsible for my anxiety disorder and that I need to seek repentance for, you know, what has caused my anxiety disorder, that my anxiety is the sin and that that is, you know, something that I, you know, can't do anything about. When I take responsibility for what my sin actually is, I can gain victory and freedom from that sin. I don't have to wait until God heals this anxiety disorder in me before I can have victory and forgiveness for my sin, before I can act and live differently than responding in anger. And this is a really powerful thing because, you know, if I could change my situation and make me not have an anxiety disorder, I would really do that. And that's not something that I do have a lot of power over. But that doesn't mean that I don't have power over my sin, that I have to have that as a constant thing in my life and something that I can't have victory over. But I can confess that anger, that I can get forgiveness for that anger, and that I can allow God to purify me from that anger. Now, which goes really easily into the last lie that women believe about sin, is that I, it is impossible to have consistent victory in, over sin, that I can't live in consistent victory. And we fall into this thought because there are certainly things that, that we can't change, like our situations. And certainly, we have expended a whole lot of willpower to stop the sin in our lives. And often we see, oh shoot, I got back into that. I responded in anger again. I engaged in useless talk once again. I, I fell into that addiction once again, that I can't have consistent victory. Thankfully, God has promised us something else. John, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That purification process, well, in general, we would like this purification to not be a process, that it to be as instant as our forgiveness um, is, that, that it's boop, confessed, purified, good, done. We would like it to be that quick of a process and then we're, we get very easily discouraged because we are not already purified, but instead we are still in that process. Now the truth is that God, through Christ, exchanged our sin for Christ's righteousness so that we have, we are the righteousness of Christ. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live, but Christ is living in me. So that, that Christ put to death our sin nature and the sin that is, you know, what we have to do. It is already dead and dead and dead. Praise the Lord. Now, we have... Christ's righteousness instilled in us, and then our sin nature killed in us. However, this purification process is God gently removing the dead stuff, the sin nature that is dead, but that is still, that we're still wearing it. Purification from unrighteousness, that is him, you know, taking off the barnacles that are 
on the bottom of a boat, to chip away everything that is not Christ in us so that Christ's righteousness shows up. Victory is possible because of Christ living in us. That doesn't mean that victory is fast, and it doesn't mean that victory feels like an easy process, but victory is possible, that it is ours in Christ Jesus. Our righteousness matters. The way that we reflect Christ is a powerful tool that God uses to expand his kingdom. If our view of sin gets skewed, we get stopped from pursuing the righteousness of Christ. We get demotivated because we don't think that it's something that we really need to work on. We get discouraged because we feel like it's not something that we can ever attain. Or we get trapped by guilt. And so we get hindered by that to, from pursuing Christ's righteousness. But when we see our sin through the lens of the cross, through the lens of that exchange that Christ did to take our sin, to take the real penalty of our sin, and to exchange that for his own righteousness, that for his nature that is enabling us to live victoriously, it is then that we are empowered to pursue the righteous life that God desires. And when we are doing that, we have greater access to everything that God has promised us in Christ Jesus.